So indeed, I would like to connect uh, learning theory with logic in this lecture. And the connection will be in the beginning quite standard. So I will look at uh, classical first order logic, uh, arithmetical hierarchy connections. But later I will do something a little bit more controversial, namely I connect um, formal learning theory with epistemic logic. And yesterday at the dinner many people asked me what is uh, model epistemic logic, so it seems like this is a uh, keyword that is not really uh, very well known in the community, which is great, because this means that I can give you a very basic introduction, which makes things easier for me. Um, and there will be a lot of funny examples and uh, small uh, toy examples. Uh, so this is the plan for the first part. And in the second part, what I will do is that I will try to make this connection between those two fields explicit, uh, mostly uh, through actually talking about my own work. Um, in connecting learning theory with topology uh, in the context of uh, modal logic. So modal logic is also given topological interpretations, and this is where we think uh, in this research program that uh, some interesting abstract connections happen. This material is very abstract. Um, it's uh, quite symbolic in nature, so I, will be not, I, I, I won't talk about probabilities at all but you should not think that it has nothing to do with probabilities because there are extensions of this work that work, uh, go this direction. And another thing is that this talk will not be also very applied. Uh, so I will not show any particular implementations. I will not talk about uh, any uh, concrete uh, problems in the real world. But you should also know that this topic connects to robotics and uh, how, how robots can actually <laughs> interpret uh, certain um, states or epistemic states and knowledge of other agents. So I would like to start with, uh, well, this is the plan for the first class. Uh, an example, a long one. Uh, then we will talk about inductive inference paradigms. Again, probably you heard a lot about these things already through the school. I actually couldn't uh, come uh, earlier, so I, I have no clue what, what they told you. Um, I hope it will be consistent with what I am saying. But uh, yeah, I will give you a short overview. And then in the end, I will introduce uh, a little bit of uh, epistemic logic. They can understand what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, how many of you are familiar with the game uh, Eleusis? One person. Great. And the organizer. That's perfect. Um, okay, so uh, the game goes as follows we have normal playing cards, like the ones you use in poker or bridge. Uh, it's just that we have this funny mathematical uh, addition that we have unlimited number of them, right? So it's not one deck, but uh, it's just as many decks as you want. And now the, the question behind, uh, the question that I'm asking you is, uh, what is the rule behind this sequence of cards? And I will show you the sequence step by step. And you as a learning algorithm or, the, or, or a learning process, each, at each step are supposed to come up with a hypothesis. And you are allowed to change your mind, of course. Right. So let's start. First, uh, first uh, discovery of, of you as scientist. You saw Ace of Spades. What is the rule behind the sequence of those cards? Yeah, very conservative choice, right? So here we have a quite timid conservative learner. Only Aces of Spades. Okay, the other. Only spades, again, why? Why would it be a good idea to say only spades? So far, yeah. Is there any operational reason why would it be a good choice of a hypothesis? Yeah? Yeah, so we shall provide the shortest explanation. Yes, the shortest, maybe the simplest, right? There's some sort of an idea behind, like if you think of your intuitions, there's some sort of simplicity order on hypothesis implicitly, right? So you would think that perhaps those hypotheses will be easier in some way or more obvious. And this is what lies um, behind the idea of Occam's razor, that uh, very often we want to pick the simplest hypothesis over more complex one in order to revise our beliefs later. And actually the whole of this lecture will be about that, maybe. What do we do now? You stick to the previous one, yeah. So you are, again, a conservative learner. 
uh, consistent and conservative, so you only would change your mind if there is evidence that contradicts your previous data. Right, that's uh, another aspect. It's a bit boring, isn't it? <laughs> but seems seems reliable. Okay, and now? Hmm? Yeah, exactly, right? So now we are looking at the sequence and perhaps we want to have some sort of temporal order to the sequence. <laughs> Right? That would be another hypothesis that is expressible in natural language, so you could actually say something like that, right? So I will have ace, queen, three, ace, queen, three, and I didn't something else going on here, because if you're conservative, mm -hmm. then you'll just skip two and instead. Exactly, yes. But uh, we find the periodicity pretty. Yes. Yes, so we have all sorts of cognitive biases as learners. Uh, which obviously in the context of logic doesn't make much difference because we don't like cognitive biases in logic. But if we think about artificial intelligence, for instance, implementing this sort of things on, in the robot that is supposed to mimic human behavior, uh, then perhaps we would like to say something about it. What is this attraction to certain types of concepts, right? That we see patterns everywhere. We try to extract them. Okay, but uh, let's see what happens next. Yeah, so now we are even more confirmed, right? And perhaps even some of us would just drop the game at this point and say, yeah, I know what it is. Um, again, uh, confirmation bias, perhaps, right? And now? <laughs> Any ideas, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Um, outlier. Okay. I, I won't even dignify this with a comment. Uh, now we go on and on, and um, yeah. Uh, if you are a, a good learner or you would like to win this game, then the idea would be that after some finite time, you would uh, stabilize on a correct answer. Right? Obviously, in such a setting, you can never know. Perhaps there will be like this devil situation and will we just screw up your hypothesis at any point uh, later in time. Uh, but uh, the idea is like this. So the game is called uh, Eleusis and it's actually quite playable. I played it in some summer schools with the students. We can also do it here if we have uh, cards. It's an extremely frustrating uh, game, but for academics it's a uh, great overview. <laughs> So now let us try to analyze this game a little bit more. So assume, as I said before, that we actually indeed have at our disposal unlimited amount of playing cards. Right? So it's not just one deck, but unlimited number. Questions to you. Uh, how many different kinds of playing cards do we have? That's a question that you should know from background knowledge. How many cards are there in a deck? The 52. 52. Not 54? 52. 52. How many different beginnings of this uh, sequences of land one? Four? No. 52. Yeah. How many different beginnings of land two? How much? No, but ki kinds. Uh, yeah. yeah. Quite a lot already, right? 52 mm -hmm. square. How many different infinite sequences? How much? Infinitely many. Yeah. Infinitely many. Any ideas about the kind of infinity that we are talking about here? Uncountable. Uncountable, yeah. So is there a problem with this? Uh, obviously there is, because if you would like to treat uh, learning just symbolically, what you would perhaps require is that you can identify some rule for any infinite sequence. But since there are uncountably many infinite sequences, you can't even list the, those hypotheses efficiently, right? So you can't have an algorithm that will actually retrieve enough information for this. Let us see, for those of you that don't know what uncountability is, uh, I would like to just show you quickly what, what the idea of a proof uh, by a Cantor's diagonalization would be. So um, assume that we actually can list all infinite sequences. So the learner can actually with super hyper precision know which sequence we are talking about. They are numbered, they are infinitely many, as many as natural numbers. And still the algorithm could search through them uh, step by step, be regards to the enumerable process. Um, and now what we want to do is construct a sequence that will not appear in this list. 
So and the assumption is this is a full list, natural numbers, a uh, full list of all possible sequences. Now we want one that does not appear. Uh, any ideas how we would go about doing that? Some hands, yeah. So what we want to do is simply replace, uh, build a new sequence, which will differ from all of them. And from the first one, will, it will differ in the first place. So instead of this, we will put whatever else. Then on the second place, it will differ from this card and so on. Right? And of course, um, in the limit, we will obtain a sequence uh, that is different from all of those that exists. It's a valid sequence. So this is roughly uh, why many of uh, my approaches and also many of uh, the approaches on the market to this abstract symbolic uh, representation of learning restrict the attention to countable cases, right? So what we would like to have is the learning framework which deals with potentially uncountably many cases, but the hypothesis space is countable, right? So by necessity, we will have to merge some of those sequences together uh, under one hypothesis. Yeah, this process. So let us talk about this hypothesis spaces. Right? So in principle, if we wanted to be super precise, we would want to describe each of the sequences separately uh, as a, with some sort of language. So in principle, we would have um, uh, uncountably many rules. But if you put any condition on them, for instance, in this game of allowances, the condition that is in the rules is that the rule is supposed to be written on a piece of paper. So it has to be actually somewhere hidden, right? So that the god, the person who comes up with a sequence cannot cheat. Another condition would be that the rule has to be expressed with a natural language sentence or with a 300 pages book, as it is with some theor scientific theories, right? So that are supposed to describe certain phenomena. And in those cases, obviously, we already restrict the hypothesis space to countably many cases because they are expressed in natural language. You can lexicographically order them. They are finite, right? So it is the case that uh, then hypothesis spaces will be uh, countable. Finally, what is mostly done in computational learning theory is that uh, this rule that is behind those cards is supposed to be encoded by a Turing machine program. Right, which is uh, kind of the same as having 300 pages book. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, having a program that's finite and uh, generates this infinite sequence or tests if it actually belongs to them. Uh, so if descriptions are finite, there are only countably many of them. Are there any questions so far? So now let us compare the evidence, so the sequences of information, the environments that we get from cards, and this hypothesis spaces. So how many sequences comply to this one rule? The sequence has solely a space cards, the, the first one that we had. Yeah, one, just one, right? That's a great hypothesis. It's very easy to falsify, right? It's just uh, one possible scenario. The sequence has solely space cards. Uncountably many, with the same argument, right? So you see, I mean, the variety here between those hypotheses is quite large. The sequence has uh, hard cards on even places. Again, right? I mean, the sequence is definable in first order logic. Right? That's another question that we might ask. Right. So uh, the point here, I'm not going to answer this question, but uh, what, what the point is here that the language that you use for the hypothesis spaces will cluster your evidence in certain ways right? and will make the process of learning easier or harder depending what a hypothesis space is. It's really crucial to know what the hypothesis space is. For those of you that are familiar with version space learning, it has very much uh, to do with, uh, with uh, uh, this way of thinking in which um, Hypotheses are eliminated by uh, certain evidence. Okay, and then we can have different hypothesis spaces. Some of them will be friendlier, some of them will be really awful. 
so for instance, the first hypothesis space will consist of uh, two rules. All cards are spades and all cards are diamonds. So those are the only two possibilities. Is it a nice hypothesis space? Very incomplete, but perhaps this is the question that we are interested in, right? This is our research question, right? It's either this or that. So it just divides our space in those two uh, cases. Um, so let us think in terms of the inductive process. Uh, how soon would we know, assuming that we get a truthful sequence complying to one of those hypothesis spaces, how soon will we know which of those it is? Straight away. So the first piece of information will allow you to know where you are and know with certainty. So after receiving this information, you know for sure where you are. You're done. The second hypothesis space. Spades at the fourth position or not spades at the fourth position. <coughs> right? So this is a decision problem. I mean, decidability problem. Truth or false, right? Of a certain hypothesis. How soon do we know? Four step, right? Okay. So now a bit more complex. Now that we have an infinite hypothesis space that consists of the following uh, formula uh, statements. Exactly n cards are hearts. And here we have such a hypothesis for every natural number. Okay. Yes. But we could perhaps try to relax the condition of decidability a little bit. Do, can you think of a way to kind of handle this problem a little bit more practically, perhaps? If you are, we are playing this game. Assume we are playing this game, and this is the hypothesis. I'm telling you, my hypothesis is one of those. And then I'm showing you a sequence of cards. Would you have a way to deal with this? Uh, as, as me or as you? Like, uh, no, the n is not fixed. I mean, I, I have it fixed in the background, so the, sec the, uh, the sequence will comply to this fixed number. Right? Well, we keep asking that the exactly Yes, but you don't know exactly n hearts, but you don't know which, and you're supposed to. Yeah, but you still decide. Yeah, it's semi because if you see more than that many cards, you can say that it's false. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so here the idea would be that we basically look at the sequence of cards and count the hearts. Right? And in each step you're allowed to give a hypothesis. So let's say it's you see the first one, you say, okay, my hypothesis is exactly one card is hearts. And then you sit back, relax, and wait for the next heart to happen. Right? The next heart happens and you say, oh, I want to change my mind. And I want to do another conjecture, which is exactly two cards are hearts. And so on. And since you know that I had to fix an N in the background, you are sure that after a finite number of steps, you will converge to the right hypothesis. Right? You don't know when this happens, but the method of learning is reliable. Yeah? In this case, in the practical version of the game where you actually can play in a pub, there is some limit to it, of course, right? So after, I don't know, 100 iterations, the idea is that uh, you win. But um, in general, mathematically speaking, there is no requirement of, um, of the end for this uh, problem. <clears throat> um, so, uh, where were I? Semi decidable, yes. So now, the idea of identifiability in the limit is exactly that. That you have a reliable learning method that you can really fall back on given the hypothesis space, but you can't really be 100% sure. And those are like different types of knowledge. One is the knowledge that gives you certainty of the states of affairs, like the first two examples. After some sample, you know for sure which hypothesis is true. In the uh, third case, this is what we would call limiting knowledge, or perhaps safe belief, something that makes the conjecture safe after a while, it will never change after a finite amount of steps, right? Uh, finally, there is a, a border there, so you can imagine that this will be something more difficult. Um, now we take the previous hypothesis space plus 
one more hypothesis which says infinitely many cards are hearts. How about this one? Can we handle this? No, we can't because uh, for any finite uh, hypothesis, any finite uh, initial segment of the data stream, we will have one hypothesis of those being consistent, but also this one will be consistent because you never know what will happen in the long run. Later on, I will show you how to prove such things on infinite sequences. Um, but the idea is that here, be be between those two, there lies this border between any learnability that you can think of in terms of symbolic uh, learning um, and the unlearn unlearnable structures. Is this clear why this hypothesis, who understands why this hypothesis space is difficult? Okay, good enough, like 90%. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Once again, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand the rules of what's going on. So if we are happy, we have only one best hypothesis at one moment. Yeah. This is the rules. If we are happy, yes. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but if, when you have two hypotheses, you're not happy. Uh, well, you could still try to define a language. So you could, for instance, use a disjunction in your logical language that says that makes it into one hypothesis. Any finite number of hypotheses would do. But in the case of uh, this particular framework, we want to pick one hypothesis at each step. That's the condition of the learner, right? But obviously, abstractly speaking, these restrictions are it's just an example. Okay. So now, what is this learning game? Um, it's a game between a learner and nature. Uh, we have a class of possible worlds, possible realities, so possible uh, enumerations of cards or possible uh, types of Turing machines, possible types of um, um, physical phenomena. And then the idea is that nature chooses one of those to be the actual one. So a range of possibilities, one of them is this special type. And nature generates data about the world. And in our framework, it generated uh, truthful information, right? So there was no noise, no errors, no nothing, except for this one outlier suggestion. Uh, perhaps it's a bit trickier. But um, the idea is that nature uh, gives us evidence of what it chose. Uh, and from this inductively given data, learner draws her conjectures. So step by step, over a growing amount of evidence, more and more information is uh, available and it's being clustered into a hypothesis space. And this hypothesis you can think of from the perspective of the actual sequence of uh, evidence. So it can be kind of constructively given from there, but you can also think from the level of hypothesis space and ask yourself a question, is it decidable which hypothesis uh, in question among the available ones is consistent with our, I guess. And the assumption here is that with each input learner can answer with a different hypothesis. And now here this condition, when is the learner successful? And this is something that is probably after this school you, you have a lot of uh, doubts about it. What does it mean to learn something, right? Because we have so many different paradigms for learning. We have reinforcement learning, we have, well, neural networks nowadays, we have uh, all sorts of uh, programming paradigms. And what is kind of obscured very often is what would be the satisfactory condition that the learning actually happened. So especially in approximate learning, what you often have is some sort of empirical criteria that you try to uh, satisfy, that the agent or a simulated agent behaves in a good enough way in the environment. Um, here in the abstract uh, context, we would uh, have two most interesting conditions. So what would be that in finitely many steps you know for sure which hypothesis space is the one of interest. And in the limiting case, after finitely many steps, you converge to the right hypothesis, right? And then you don't change your mind. And then learning is still successful because the learning method is reliable. So I would say that the learner succeeds if she stabilizes to a correct hypothesis over time, right? And now the connection of the, the notion of stability is something um, stabilize, stabilizing is something that you can choose. I mean, there are many different options. 
So obviously, as we saw from our analysis game, the success of the learner depends very much on her skills. So how good the learner is, uh, what type of procedure ha it has in the background, but also on the problem definition, right, on the hypothesis space. So those will be two things. Just to make sure I understand clearly, stabilized here means that um, the learner's hypothesis eventually converges to a fixed point, but the learner herself may not know. She's, the game isn't stopped yes. with Bell saying you've won. Yes. We're looking at the behavior of yeah. the learner. Yeah, so if you want to uh, treat it uh, in more detail mathematically, you would say that the actual n, the step at which the answer is correct, is not computable. The moment at which you would converge is not computable. However, the learner is often assumed to be a Turing machine, which it, at each step actually makes a computation and tries to uh, come up with a reasonable hypothesis. And it keeps on going. And this is a notion of learning that is known since the 50s. And I, I will give you a little bit of uh, intuitions behind it. Um, any other questions at this point? Yeah? So we're not considering like probabilistic learning at all, so the possibility that there's an error Yeah. Uh, probabilistic learning came to be um, in the first place. Um, some of the teachers probably might disagree with me uh, here. But it came from this type of discoveries, that there is certain wiggle space between knowing for sure after finite amount of time and the limiting version of learning, right? And then you basically are supposed to add certain parameters above which you agree you already are willing to, like probably approximately correct learning, for instance, back learning, right? It, you just have to have a certain threshold on which you are willing to agree on the hypothesis, right? So it's a way to, to cope with the complexity of limiting inference. But I'm not going to talk about probabilities. I'm very sorry. I know that some people are disappointed. OK, so uh, various inference paradigms. And here, just a short uh, run through uh, different possibilities. So um, this is how I usually think of a learning paradigm. So you have several <coughs> criteria that you have to just uh, fit in this list. So, for instance, you can think that uh, your algorithm or you as a researcher are interested in learning functions. So you want to know the certain phenomena, you have some assumption that it behaves like a function, and you want to know what kind of function this is, right? So you want to perhaps infer a Turing machine in this of it or whatever. So we assume the possible realities to be functions, then hypotheses are some names of functions, perhaps indeed indices of Turing machine, or perhaps we want to have some fragment of mathematics in which we can express these functions. Uh, now, information accessible to the learner would then be a sequence of pairs, argument value, because this is what function does. It takes one argument and goes into some sort of um, yeah, value. Uh, so you infer from those pairs, you infer from the graph of the function which function uh, in question, which, which function is being a learner. Now, the, the learner is a function that takes a sequence, so a finite but a progressively growing finite sequence and outputs a hypothesis from the hypothesis space. And the success criterion will be defined in the following way. So after a finite uh, number of outputs, we stabilize to a correct answer. This, this will be function learning. We can also think of model theoretic uh, realities. We don't have to think about functions. We can also think that there is some sort of model. We want to learn what the reality is like with objects being in relations with each other, um, let's say a robot in the room tries to figure out what is the actual description of the, of the situation in question. And uh, this is a work of uh, Oshersson mostly, um, elements of scientific inquiry if you would like to have a look at it. Uh, model theoretic learning uh, assumes that possible realities are actually models, logical models of given signature. Uh, how many of you knows what a signature of a model is? Oh, this side only, that's interesting. <laughs> Left brain, right brain, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, the signature basically specifies in a certain type of logical language um, what are we allowed to talk about within a model. So what kind of objects you have. You have certain entities, but you also have relations, functions, and then the language is supposed to uh, talk about the structures. Now the hypothesis spaces in such cases are usually first order sentences. So a little bit like the ones that I actually gave, like exactly 
and cards are hearts. Those would be first order definable sentences. And information accessible to the learner is not just like two numbers, like in the case of function, but it's actually sequences of atomic formulas. So we have grounded atoms, so some, we talk about certain objects in the reality and we say that relations or functions hold of them on the atomic level. And then this is information given about the world. Now the function, uh, the learner is a function that takes sequences of such data and outputs a hypothesis. And after a finite number of outputs, we stabilize to a correct answer. This is something that is alarmingly close to model checking, right? Because uh, we are just trying to figure out whether certain um, uh, first order formula will describe the model. And finally, something that will be of interest to us is the most basic way of thinking about this inductive inference, which is via sets, set theory. Right? So we now assume that there is no more structure to the actual uh, realities than just the bunch of stuff that is in the world, a bunch of facts, a bunch of uh, sequences uh, of natural language and so on. So possible realities would be sets of integers, a hypothesis would be names of sets, uh, information accessible to the learner uh, sequences or infinite streams of numbers, and now uh, learner is a function that takes a sequence and outputs a hypothesis again after finite steps, uh, finitely many steps of, our, um, of uh, inquiry, we stabilize to a correct answer. I'm repeating this last condition many times because I would like it to be tattooed. Uh, <coughs> so let's uh, consider some examples. Learning sets. So let us consider the following class. Um, we have uh, this uh, hypothesis space. Uh, the hypothesis space tells you that uh, we uh, basically have, it's possible that the sequence that you will see conforms to, it's necessary that it conforms to exactly one of those. And each of them says all natural numbers except one. So the first hypothesis says all natural numbers except four. The second, all natural numbers except two, all natural numbers except three, and so on. Is that clear? So we have... Uh, natural numbers without one singleton and all of such. So let's, let's try to see if we can play it. So I'm giving you the sequence now. What would you answer after seeing one? Hmm? All except two, yeah. I mean, zero is excluded, just for... Why would you say that? So thank you very much. Usually this uh, answer comes very uh, mu much later uh, in the talk. But uh, let's see what happens here. So you saw one. If you thought in terms of, let's say, version space learning or elimina eliminative learning, this evidence allows you to eliminate how many hypotheses from this space? Just one, right? So you eliminate this and you're still hmm, nowhere, right? I mean, you have infinitely many of those at your disposal. You could claim that the learner can just somehow describe all this complexity, but the goal is to actually figure out which one. Now here the answer that was given uh, to this question is basically to come up with a method uh, that perhaps will make you very slow in learning, but uh, it will be a conservative way of changing your mind from one hypothesis to the other, following some sort of order of simplicity on hypothesis. And this order of simplicity is very problem specific, right? So in this case, it will be uh, related to this. So just to, uh, to illustrate, what, what would you say now after three? Everything except two. Everything except two. Everything except two. Everything except one. Yes. So now we, again, after this step, we are looking for the smallest number, the minimal number that does not appear in the sequence. Right? And you can prove, uh, I suppose I will even show you a proof of this, that after 
that, that you can actually rely on this method in the in the long run to identify this class. Yeah. So then, but then we are assuming that the um, that the environment basically generates every possible uh, every possible number. Right? Yes. This is again this assumption that the sequences uh, the sequences are sound and complete with respect to the hypothesis in question. And again, this notion soundness and completeness, you probably know it from logic, right? But, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, but there's, I mean, there's nothing special to the order of these numbers, right? If we were talking about sets, this would be like A, B, C, D, or whatever, yeah. A, N, this yeah. would be. So why B2 and not whatever is 900? Uh, it would be a little bit messy because you would have to define for your algorithmic procedure a way that you recover. So if you now say everything except 150, right? Then what happens if you at some point see 150? What do you do? It's another uniformly random number. Yeah, but stop with these probabilities, okay? I mean, we are not talking about that. <laughs> we are talking about symbolic methods. Of course, I mean, then you can show certain... It's a way to cope with this problem, right? But. <laughs> Well, um, list all hypotheses that are still possible. Yes, it's a way to do that. It would take some time for the learner to list after the first step. Um, so if you were waiting until the procedure of listing finishes, then... Well, I, mean, I can express them in a single sentence, right? Every possible number yeah. of the same sentence. But then the problem will resurface on the level of more complex hypotheses. I mean, this is an abstract problem of actually having a hypothesis space and the evidence and they don't match or they match in certain ways. So what I will try to do is to talk in the second part about how to construct those simplicity orders. What kind of logical structure they have. Uh, but indeed your doubts are kind of steps forward that have been actually taken after this. Um, would another reasonable strategy be to um, consider the sequence of numbers that we've seen so far when picking the next hypothesis to test? Because there might be, you might start to see some structure, meaning perhaps it describes a function which you know is asymptotic at a yeah. specific mm -hmm. uh, x coordinate, and then it might be more evidence to suggest that you should go for that. Yeah. You mean that the, the learner can be proactive uh, in terms of asking questions? Yes, and actually, this version of the game, of Eleusis game with the cards that I showed you, is the first version that is extremely hard to play. In the new version, it's called the new Eleusis, invented by Matuszek, I think. Um, the idea there is that the, the players are actually making experiments. So they are thinking, I know the hypothesis, and now I will play this card in order to either make myself even more convinced, which many people actually do. So they are kind of playing cards that conform to their hypothesis, and they go nowhere with it. Or you try to falsify the rule um, with a certain evidence. And indeed, it changes. Um, but here, you can think a little bit in terms of uh, positive and negative data, so learning from full information. OK. okay. This goes on. Um, OK, so uh, uh, a couple of questions about this previous game. Um, we actually covered this already with this answer. So um, the level of confidence in this learning. Each time uh, that you actually make a hypothesis, the level of confidence is kind of tricky, right? Because it's a, it's a temporary hypothesis, something that you are willing to change. But it's still essential to make it because the learning is defined in a way that what matters is the sequence of hypotheses that switch, right? Not the actual time point. Um, what would make us change our guess? Well, we answered that. Uh, what is the guessing rule? The guessing rule in this case was somehow driven by the order of hypothesis that was underneath of the learning problem. Uh, now, how do you like the winning condition uh, of this game that says uh, at least one of your guesses is correct? Yeah. When it's uh, not consistent at some point, we shall switch to the next element. Yeah. So is it uh, everything compatible? We uh, win the game. Actually, yes, but 
even more than that. So if this were our learning condition, you are fine if, yeah? Excuse me? Yeah. So the most uh, trivial situation is that you actually just go through the sequence of rules. You don't care, right? Of course, one of them will be correct at some point. Right? So that's why we want to consider a bit more complex condition. Now, um, if you succeed to make a right guess and never change your mind after that, how many wrong guesses could you make under this condition? In the previous scenario with... Uh, Only finite, yeah. So uh, this is actually something that is called uh, mind change complexity in uh, formal learning theory, in which uh, what we measure as a complexity of learning is how many times the learner has to change their mind until they converge to the right hypothesis, right? And it's, it's a measure that is much nicer than measuring the size of the sample, because in such frameworks, you never know where the evidence will pop up, right? Simple evidence will come like very late. Okay. So the last part of this game, um, assume that I will give you all and only truthful clues as so far. What would be the guessing rule to win according to the last winning condition? Ah, this we already did. You're too fast for, for this slide. Mm. Now what we want to do in the second point, we want to add all natural numbers to our hypothesis space. Is the guessing rule that was proposed still good for learning in the limit? Yes. So if we go back to this example, here we have it inductively given growing number of points. And now what we get is that uh, we keep on switching, looking for the minimal that is missing in the sequence. Right? But there will be always a minimal that will be missing. And it's not the case that there will be minimal that is missing for this additional hypothesis that takes into account all natural numbers. So we will never, according to this guessing rule, we will never get out of... Um, of this sequence. Um, <coughs> now, um, while keeping this hypothesis, again, the uh, hypothesis of natural numbers, assume that what I guarantee to you is that my sequences will come in an increasing order. So the evidence will come. Would you uh, win this game now? So what changed now is the postulated simplicity order underneath of the hypothesis. Because what the learner should do is to start with a full set of natural numbers, right? which first of all is the biggest set among those. Well, yeah, depending how you think of it. Um, second of all, it's very much uh, learning driven. So it's driven by the procedure that is learning. So what you can see is that the simplicity order of hypothesis is very much dependent on the learner, on the hypothesis space, right? Those are two things that, that matter, and the structure of the evidence. And then the second part of the lecture, I will try to make this thing specific and try to come up with objective criteria for the simplicity in logic. Um, so if you would like to... Uh, read and you're interested in logic, and I know that some of you actually are, at least I hope my students sitting there are interested in <laughs> logic. It's a threat. Um, <laughs> then you should perhaps uh, do some digging in the library and uh, look at the papers from the 60s and hear the name of uh, Hilary Putnam uh, would uh, pop up, um, trial and error predicates and the solution to the problem of Mos Andrzej Mostowski. Um, and actually, this relates to this uh, decidability, semi-decidability controversy that we had here. So what is the right notion of decidability? Uh, does this concept of uh, identification the limit give you a little bit more insight into higher level? Uh, obviously, did you hear about Mark Gold in this school? No? Yes, one person heard. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
yeah, I will show those results now. So um, actually, it is quite interesting that gold does not appear in such context because uh, this was the first attempt. Uh, his work became uh, remained <laughs> hidden. He worked for Rand Corporation. Uh, the first paper that he um, published on limiting recursion was published in 65 at the same time as Hillary's uh, Putnam's paper. Uh, but only on the 67, he po postulated this language identification in the limit. And this was strictly in response to Chomsky's ideas about formalizing a natural language with grammars. And what uh, Mark Gold proposed is that we can think of the reversed Chomsky paradigm. So instead of thinking that grammars generate the proper sequences in a certain language, what we want is we want to look at the se sentences that appear in natural language and come up with the grammars that generated them in the first place, okay? which is basically what inductive inference is like. Um, and of course, uh, Reis uh, Solomonov and here, this is uh, something that is probably known to many of you, this work. How many of you know this work? Three. Um, Again, first paper on inductive inference. And all of those uh, guys, they, they knew logic. All of those guys uh, draw, drew their ideas from decidability, semi-decidability uh, uh, differences. How does that work? So a predicate, yeah? So, yeah, so our assumption would be, first of all, that um, one of them has to appear because the sequence is consistent with one of the hypotheses. If in our hypothesis we would have all cofinite sets, so sets for which the complement is finite, then it would be a different algorithm. But then we still can enumerate them, so it um, would be possible. Um, Okie doke. So now we go to uh, decidability. So what are those trial and error predicates in logic? And this is the most classical connection to logic that you can make, like the, the original way of thinking about this uh, learning paradigms. So a predicate, set P, is decidable if there is an effective procedure, and here by effective, mm, computable, uh, such that X of P, so a certain object belongs to the set or satisfies this predicate, if and only if this computable function gives you one, right, computably, and not P if it gives you zero. That's something that you all, as adepts of model checking and all sorts of things, know very well how this stuff works. So now, the question that those guys ask themselves, what happens if we modify this condition by allowing phi to change her mind any finite number of times. Right, so she says one, then she says, ah, oh, no, zero, right? And then she says, oh, maybe one, yeah? Still would be decidable. Yeah, well, it would be decidable if we knew the number, the actual number of times, because we would know when, when to take the Turing machine seriously. You mean that uh, we have an oracle or what? No, I mean that we have a finite number of programs or maybe a continually remaining number of programs. And one of them uh, decides P. Yes. We don't know which one, but P is decidable since by definition there should exist at least one program and such a program exists. The problem that you say and the problem uh, would be here is that we shall find how somehow find this um, predicate mm -hmm. by some strategy. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same thing as the derivative. Yes. So it is semi decidable in this sense. This is what you mean. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So this is, this relax, relaxing, it might seem a crazy uh, condition, but not as crazy as it could be. I mean, we could imagine crazier. I mean, it, it seems like many at least cognitive phenomena, they work this way. There is some com cognitive computa computable program and it just keeps adjusting over time, right? And, and we are fine with that. We don't want to have like definite answer straight away. We just want some sort of reliability conditions that are satisfied. 
so this is how you formally spell it out. Uh, so P is a trial and error predicate. Uh, if there is a Turing machine phi such that uh, x, uh, P of x, if and only if there exists a point, natural number, such that for all points after that, the machine in this steps answers one, and otherwise it answers zero. So the idea is from some finite point on, we just stabilize to the correct answer, right? And here what you can see is that we have just those two conditions, zeros and ones, but this is not what we've done so far. Now, we, before we didn't only answer zero, one, we answered with many possible hypotheses. So our outputs were natural numbers. We could answer with any indice of a Turing machine. Right, so it's an extension, definitely. Ah, and there you can actually, uh, you can flip. Effective procedure, recursive function, Turing machine, right? So all those things uh, classify under, under this particular connection. Uh, questions at this point? Uh, so now, uh, Klini Mostowski arithmetical hierarchy, uh, and for those of you that uh, know a little bit about topology, this would also go all the way to Borel. Uh, how many of you know Borel hierarchy? Some. I'm not going to go into that in this talk, but uh, here the idea is that you can um, talk about ranges of arithmetical or topological complexity, thinking of logical formulas that are essential to express them. Right, so here at the bottom we have um, a condition that a set is, or a predicate is computable. Then here we have that there exists a point such that uh, the answer is being given, so it's existential condition. Uh, then we have something that is expressible both by ex uh, existential and universal condition. And here we have uh, actually the trial and error predicates. And we have also uh, sigma zero two, which is often associated with uh, learning processes. Um, the quantifier prefix in the definition of trial and error predicates indicates that the place of arithmetical hierarchy is here, and if you consider full learning here. Um, this is the quantifier prefix, exists for all, right? Sigma zero two. Good. So in general, what I will do uh, in the second part of this lecture is I will uh, both talk about this binary case in which you have decidability, but also a more refined cases in which you, you, you as a learner are asked to say exactly which reality you think we have, not only answer some general question, but also, um, uh, yeah, hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give some intuition why the sigma zero two is associated to Why the sigma zero two is? Um, it's because if you think of uh, a dual condition, so the condition, uh, the positive condition will be there exists a point after which I know which hypothesis holds, right? But um, if it doesn't mean that you have to know that it doesn't. So you, you might not be able to exclude a hypothesis, but you might be able to uh, learn it. Right? Yeah. As we had in this case of when uh, each uh, information point had just eliminated just one hypothesis. Right? So there's this uh, discrepancy between the two. But I hope we will, I will talk about this a little bit more later. Let's see where we are. Um, some more intuitions. Um, <coughs> Those are, th this slide is for your convenience. So um, it's basically introducing the basic notation that is used in this literature. Uh, we talk about streams of information. They're often called texts, because if you think of not language learning, it will be the text that you're learning from, so sequences of, of data uh, that come from, from the language. And it, uh, no, most of the time it will enumerate all and only the elements of the set. Right, so there will be no noise, no errors. I will relax these conditions a bit. Just a minor question. Um, just to clarify, does your end start at zero or one? Um, for me, it starts at zero most of the time. Uh, but so in the first line, you say it's positive integer. I know. Well, uh, so I have many co-authors in my papers. And sometimes I paste the definition from one paper, sometimes from another, and then uh, some of them like zeros, some of them don't. Normally, I would include zero. 
The problem is that uh, then uh, you have to cope with minus ones. And, yeah, uh, sometimes the parameters become a little bit obscured when you read the paper. So yeah, that's why there is this. Sometimes my slides might be incorrect in this respect. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, here you see I'm starting with zero. Um, yeah. So a set is a family of sets that we are learning. We have a stream of observation from one of those sets, any of those sets, and any stream, so any order. Uh, and we will uh, use the following notation. So uh, Tn now will stand for the, yeah, exactly, nth element of uh, T. Uh, then this will be the initial sequence up to n minus 1. And the content will be something that you, you just remove the order uh, from the elements. You just think about the content of the sequence without thinking of the enumeration. And uh, the learning sequences of numbers into a number. This is what I call a learning function. Uh, but uh, the real reason is that those two ends, they have different uh, ontological status. This n is an n that talks about the content of the set. This n is something like an index of a Turing machine, right? But what is nice about this number theoretical paradigms is that we can actually do everything with natural numbers. Right? It's just a matter of keeping in mind a certain encoding in, uh, in question. For those of you that don't know about uh, coding, I'm sorry, but we won't talk about it. Uh, but you should trust me that it's possible to, to assign numbers to those functions and just treat them as natural numbers. So now the formal condition. Uh, identifiability in the limit will give you the following sequence of conditions. So we have a learning function as before, and now we say that the learning function identifies a set out of this space in the limit on a certain stream if for cofinitely many m's, for cofinitely many steps, it actually outputs the indice of the set. So it points to the right one. Uh, now, it identifies um, the set independently of the stream if it identifies the set on every enumeration for the set. So this is the condition that, you know, there's no cheating in the learning process. If we just require that the learning function will just stabilize on one sequence of evidence, one particular sequence, you could code the answer in this, right? So there could be... So he, here the idea is that independently of what will be the order of presentation, you are actually converged to the right hypothesis. It identifies uh, the whole class in the limit if it identifies in the limit every element from this class. So now we can talk also about the identifiability of the whole hypothesis space instead of talking uh, about identifiability of the And now S is identifiable in the limit if some learning function identifies S in the limit. So it's an existential condition again. There has to exist a function that learns it. Right? So this is what I mean by learnability or identifiability in the limit, a sequence of conditions. So this is like really bulletproof, right? I mean, any uh, enumeration, any set, and from a certain type of classes. Any questions about this? Yeah. Uh, Co-finite is, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, just finitely many guesses are wrong, which is the same as saying that after a finite number of steps, uh, we will have the right answer. Right, because if you just think in terms of magnitudes here, it's just that finitely many are wrong. Okay. So some examples of learnable classes. We have um, a class that contains um, all finite initial segments of natural numbers. Right, so uh, finite sets uh, one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, and so on. Now, we can claim, we can show that this class is identifiable in the limit by simply giving this learning function. And this learning function says, it's defined in the way that we expected it to be, it takes a sequence, finite sequence of uh, natural numbers, and it outputs the maximal element from the content that it saw so far. Right? So as a result, it will point to the right encoding at the right time. Then it will, of course, change its mind um, indefinitely, perhaps. But at some point, if it's the right learning paradigm, it will stop. It will stabilize. 
questions to this? How many of you can parse this definition? So so. It depends on the way that you call the hypothesis. Or the i. It's i is can you think of you can think of it as an ordering, but you can also think of it as coding. That you called the sets with natural numbers. Right? In this case, actually it's even easier because since those are finite sets, you could just ans answer with the whole set computably. Right? You could just say this is the set in question. The answer of what? To what? Sorry? Yeah, um, yeah, but what we are saying here, yeah, this will be the result, this is what it, this says, right? So S1 is identifiable in the limit by this function, and this fun so this function that it identifies this in the limit means that at some point this will be the right index, right? So it's, it's uh, included in the definition. So now uh, this I want, uh, for those of you who, uh, don't want coffee in the break, perhaps you can go through, through this argument uh, over, over the break. Um, so now what we have is a problem in which we have finite, the same class as before, but on top of it we have all natural numbers. Oh, what the hell, I will go through it. So um, to show that this is the case, let us assume that there is a function, a learner, that identifies this new class. Well, we want to show that it's not identifiable in the limit. So now we will construct a sequence, an infinite sequence of observations on which this function, whatever this function is, it will fail. Right? It's a little bit, it's one of those mathematical arguments that sometimes make your head spin. And let's see how it goes. So our sequence starts by enumerating n in order 0, 1, 2, and so on. If at the number k, our learner uh, who is supposed to be a good identifier, a nice learner that knows what they're doing, uh, decides that it's a zero, like whichever hypothesis, T starts repeating K indefinitely. And this means that T is a test for, for text for SK. As soon as phi decides that it's SK, we continue with K plus one, K plus two, and so on. So it will become the text for S zero, and so on, right? So what we are basically doing is we are using the assumption of the existence of the good learner in order to construct a text on which this learner will always fail. So as soon as it thinks that it's a finite set, we will, tell, we will keep feeding him more and more. And as long as he says, okay, I give up, this is the infinite set, then we stop at, at that point and we don't give him anything else. Okay. So this is what is known as Gold's theorem uh, and the proof of Gold's theorem. Yeah. No, not mathematically speaking. I mean, this is a non-constructive proof, right? I mean, we are not using a particular learning method here. It's that you don't have to point to the right, right learner. It's just saying that whichever learner would... But you're looking at the, what the learner does. Only what he asks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, only what he asks. But if you don't <coughs> see that, it's so catastrophic. The proof itself does not have to be computable. Right? It's not like we expect a Turing machine to make this proof, yeah? But it, but it assumes that at some point the learner will change its, its uh, decision from uh, S0 to SK. So what if he doesn't do that? If he doesn't do that, then he fails to identify the hypothesis which does not, uh, um, which is consistent with the infinite sequence, but... You just say it's the infinite sequence, so this, so this proof, I think it, it only works if the learner, um, you, you have chosen S0 because otherwise you can't, you couldn't do that. Because otherwise you couldn't, so you couldn't do that in this. Yeah, but then if, uh, if I start with any other hypothesis, right, what I can do is simply, again, manipulate him. So keep, on, keep him changing his hypothesis forever. If he says S1, I will give him two. If he says S2, I will give him three, and so on, or, you know. So I will keep him in an infinite mind change, which will, in which case he will fail to identify because he won't stabilize, right? Um, 
Yeah, and there are also other examples. Right? So here we have a, a class of sets that we considered in the beginning, so just uh, sets with one integer missing. And now we have two theorems. Uh, the class of all finite languages is identifiable. The class containing all finite and at least one infinite language is not identifiable. And those are two gold theorems. Right. And actually, uh, of course, this is a bit more general than what I showed you in the previous slide, because previous slide talked only about initial segments of natural numbers. This is about all finite sets. But what this uh, did, historically, uh, is that it uh, kind of challenged uh, the Chomskyan way of thinking about language. And, uh, because it, it just said, okay, reverse it. Think about learnability. We are failing at the most basic level, because if you think of the levels of Chomsky hierarchy, um, except finite languages that are at the very core, nothing else would be identifiable. So you could not learn. And we are talking back before all these things with statistical methods happen, uh, mostly. So people thought like, okay, so this cannot be the right model for learning because we actually do learn regular languages, supposedly maybe, as humans. Or we learn, we want our machines to learn context-free grammars. What happens there? How do we cope with this problem? Uh, so either Chomsky hierarchy or gold learning must be off or both, cognitively. Cognitively, right? Of course, I mean, as a mathematical concept, this just exists, right? I'm a realist. This exists and it's fine, right? We should keep it. We shouldn't throw it away. So boom. Um, it was a problem. <laughs> so what happened after were actually many attempts to uh, think about goal learning in different ways, like uh, the pack learning and computational learning theory uh, came out, and um, obviously, like you know, just the controversy between the the problem there, it spiked huge uh, research interest. Another uh, solution to this problem was to think to question Chomsky hierarchy as something that we should actually be so obsessed with, and this is where you can think of pattern languages, something that emerged that is orthogonal to Chomsky hierarchy. The idea that actually languages are just following some simple uh, patterns that are not consistent with uh, automata theoretic perspective. Uh, and here the name of Dana Angloin should uh, pop out. How many of you know the name? Dana? Yeah. So she actually proposed uh, a lot of interesting algorithms for uh, coping with this problem. Okay, so um, as a summary before... Um, the second part. Uh, there is a very interesting paper by uh, Kugel, uh, which um, the title is um, Thinking is More Than Computing. And it might sound a little bit vague and like wishful thinking, especially in the light of Church Turing hypothesis that our minds are Turing machines. But the idea of this paper is that we are actually perhaps Turing machines, but our success definition is not a computable case. Like, for instance, if you think about language learning, you don't expect that people really converge in finite time to the right hypothesis about what is the grammar in question. There's some sort of open-endedness. In this paper, you can see a lot of examples varying from computer science to artificial intelligence, uh, cognitive science, that kind of are uh, substantiating this claim that limiting knowledge is actually an interesting concept, perhaps even more interesting than certainty as something we should aspire to as researchers or scientists or learners. True, there are good reasons for preferring the computable way of deriving knowledge. We know the results of computations and only think we know the results of trial and error procedures. There are many reasons for preferring knowing to thinking, as Popper observes, but that does not change the fact that sometimes thinking may be more appropriate. 